everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah from the JRAN Steering Group. That stands for Joint Refugee Action Network. Um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Lord Alf Dobbs today uh, to our session on coaching and mentoring. JRAN is all about bringing people together, people and organisations that are working at the front line uh, to share learning, knowledge, best practice, and also crucially, crucially to drive for action for positive change. Um, in terms of mentoring and coaching, that's very much on the individual level, but also about creating spaces where all voices can be heard. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from Lord Dubbs now about his experiences as a refugee coming to this country, his learning, what's touched his life, uh, and I'm sure all sorts of other things too. So over to you, Alf. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you for inviting me this morning and congratulations to Jay Ann for the very important work that you're doing and, and, and good luck good luck to you in the, in, the, in, the, in the future. Well, I came to Britain at the age of six as an unaccompanied child refugee from Czechoslovakia on a kinder transport. Uh, and I suppose I had all the experiences of, of, of coming to another country. I was very lucky in that my father had escaped beforehand. Uh, I should say this was when, uh, this was in the summer of 1939, when the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia in March. My father left immediately, he was Jewish, and, uh, and then my mother was refused permission to leave and got me on a kinder transport. So I had, I had the sense of going into the unknown, but it was an easy journey. It was two days on a train, a bewildering journey, because I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. Uh, and, and of course, when I got to England, I spoke Czech and German, I spoke about three words of English. So I had the usual experience of many refugees <laughs> of having to try and learn the language, <laughs> except to say that at the age of six, it's straightforward. At the age of six, you learn pretty fast because survival in a school playground means you've got to learn. Whereas when you get older, it's more difficult. So I, I probably found it easier to, uh, to learn English as a six-year-old than, than would somebody who was 18 or, or somebody who, who was even older. So I have to, I have to acknowledge that, that, that that was fairly straightforward for me uh, after the initial surprise of not being able to under, understand people. Anyway, it, it, was, it, 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 was, um, it was a strange world. My, my father died soon afterwards. My mother did escape. So it, it was all, um, it, it was all a, a, world of, a world of being a, a child, slightly bewildered still, but not as bewildered as I was on the journey. And actually people were pretty, were pretty welcoming. And I always felt that if only, um, if only we could give the same welcome and the same opportunities to, to young people arriving in Britain today as I had, then it, it would be pretty good because after all, I, 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 I found it not, not too difficult in a way, although I had a somewhat bewildering start, arriving at um, Liverpool Station with a dog tag, having had a two day journey. So uh, if, I could, if I could move forward to today's, uh, to today's refugees, my, my point of entry to this was of course, trying to help uh, unaccompanied child refugees get to this country. But then we had the situation of what can we done to help them? whether they're in local, with local authorities or whether they're, whether they're, whether they're with, <laughs> with their own families, if some of them have got here, and how, how we move forward with that. And what, what I felt was important was in, in many ways, not to, treat, not to treat child refugees as somebody in a museum, as somebody who's quite different, but to, but to try in any way possible to give them a chance to normalize their lives and to do all the things that refugees uh, that refugees would like to do, which 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 children here like, which children here do anyway. So uh, there have to be ways of 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 helping them to move in. There were a lot of um a, a lot of um, organisations that were set up locally to welcome refugees, and and a lot of this has to be done at, uh, at the local level. And they often ask me what can be done, and I say look, get involved, you know, meet them, uh, help them, uh, sport, and so on. Uh, I, I was um, uh, parking before the pandemic. Uh, I went one day to there was a local park in, in Fulham, and, the, and there were there were um, um, uh, teams of ref refugees and other children just playing soccer. Wonderful thing to be doing. And when I talked to uh, a refugee who came here, who was older now, about seventeen, in the college, and and you know the immediate bonding point was mutual support for football in Manchester United, and we had a wonderful little event which you can't replicate easily. And it's this, that uh, <clears throat> Fulham, the Fulham Football Foundation and the Chelsea Football Foundation arranged a joint event at Fulham Football Ground in order that, that they could provide training for refugee children. Now they're all boys, so we should 
next time we'll have to look at how girls do that. But I said, and Guy Lineker came to help us. It was a wonderful occasion. And I, I didn't play football, but I walked, walked on this pitch. Uh, and when I was their age, I'd have cut my left hand off to have a chance to get on a big football pitch. But the idea was to say, look, these are normal things that, that, that young, people, young people want to do. And, and locally here, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a group that they have one day a week for refugees. And each refugee group, these are adults, so they, they, they provide food from their own background and they provide it for others and their English language classes and so on. So these are all the day-to-day -day things which actually help and which enable them to, enable them to engage. I've been involved in some, trying to get some work done on, on mental health support for child refugees. And there was one interesting quote uh, I haven't, haven't published it yet, uh, interesting quote by a, a refugee boy who said, uh, who said to the interviewer, uh, I, don't, I don't want to have, be here with mental health problems. I want to sing and dance and play. In other words, one has to be careful that we don't start rushing into refugees and saying, oh, because you're a refugee, you've got a problem, therefore we want to help you with your problem. They don't want that necessarily. They may want that, but they may not. And we have to be very careful not to say, because you're a refugee, we're rushing in, we're rushing in to deal, deal with the problem. Maybe what you want is what, what, a chance to, to learn English better, to, to have sport, to go into sport and so on, none of these other things. So, so I, you know, I have to be careful. I have to be careful about this. And then there was a, this, I'll finish on this. There was a, there's some army bags in Folkestone. And the Home Office were putting adult, mainly adult refugees, into those bags. And we were shocked when we learned from a local support group what was going on there. I couldn't visit it because of the pandemic. Absolutely shocking. These were people who were in uh, with not proper heating, it was in the cold weather, uh, in inadequate food, lacking proper mental support. And what was worse was they were sleeping in dormitories and they were mixing up people with COVID with, with people who hadn't got COVID. And we said, this is no way to treat people. And the Home Office, the Home Secretary said, oh, no, it's all right. The army, 15 years ago, the army used to occupy these bags. Well, that was a pretty doubtful argument for saying refugees should be subjected to terrible conditions, particularly in, in the situation of COVID. So I think we have to be on the alert as to how people are treated and to give them a chance to have a better life than just being sidelined into an army bags. So, so putting it all together, and I work mainly with child refugees, there are all sorts of things that can be done locally. There are ways in, in which young people can be helped. Schools can do a great job with this. Uh, and so I welcome the initiative you've shown, and I believe that, 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 that you can help to make the life of, of refugees better, uh, more tolerable uh, in this country where there's still hostility, uh, and help people to have as normal a life as possible so that they're part of our local community rather than being treated as some, somebody special or different. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you, Lord Dubs. This is Juliet. I, I work with JRAN. I wanted to ask you, um, through your life, this, this session's about mentoring, and I wanted to ask you if there's been a time where you have been mentored and it has had an impact on your life. Well, I don't think I don't think I have been. Uh, no, I had to learn English, and then I was at school, and and there was there wasn't there wasn't much an opportunity to be a mentor. I have to say, had I been, life might have been a lot easier in some ways uh, in the early days when I was here, because uh, my mo mother did escape. My father died, so my mother look, look, looked uh, uh, had to do things, and of course she was she was um, uh, she was uh, much more obviously a foreigner than I was because her English was very poor compared to mine. Uh, so the answer is, it would have been very helpful to me had I had such mentoring, but it wasn't an opportunity open, open in 1939, 1940, 41. And, and um, I suppose later on, have there been moments where you have been a mentor and your mentee has had an impact on your life, or there have been people that have impacted on your life when you perhaps didn't expect them to? Well, difficult. difficult. Of course, I've met quite a few of the refugees who've come here. And, and I have talked to them, and sometimes I had one, one uh, young, well, was a young man then, he was from Syria, and he actually came to work for me in Parliament, this was before the pandemic, came to help me in Parliament for, for, for a little while, uh, and I think that was a positive experience. And he and I also did double acts talking to schools and so on, where we told them about the refugee situation. So I met a number of refugees who, um, who came under some of the legislation that I was, uh, 
I was able to get through uh, and talk to them and and discuss with them what they're doing. So in that sort of rather informal way, I, I have met people. We, we have discussed things, uh, and many of them want want actually to have want to know more about what they can do in life and so on. I had a young Syrian standing in front of Parliament on the Green, and he said, "You know what I want to do in life?" And I said, "No, you tell me." He said, "I want to." I want to become a member of parliament. So I thought, that's terrific, terrific. Just improve your English a bit and you can do it. So I've had lots of discussion of that sort, which I hope they find helpful, but they were very informal chats rather than anything else. Uh, hello, it's Sarah again. I, I think I'm asking the next question. I was really interested actually when you were talking about football, um, because that's something we've, we've done locally. I, I know one of the fantastic organisations here has done that and also created a garden space and cooking. And I think you, you said yourself that often it's the informal places. Um, and, and you've mentioned that you're, you've worked a lot, sorry, <coughs> sorry, with um, uh, Syrian refugees, etc. cetera. I, I suppose I wondered, I, I'm always really interested in what we learn from the people we are supposedly there helping or walking alongside. Um, what, what do you think you've learned most from the people you have informally mentored as such? I think, the ones I've spoken to, I've been very impressed by the long and difficult journeys they've had, what they've gone through, the terrible experiences in life, and how they, they're they very keen to adjust to life in this country and to get on with things. And, and in a way, it, it's almost, almost difficult to understand how some of them could have had the most awful experiences they've had, and yet they've come out on top of it and, and are, are being very positive uh, and are quite, quite eager to meet politicians because they say, well, we politicians are the ones who change the legislation to enable them to come here. So uh, what I've learned from them is the strength of character. Let me tell you a little story. I was at a refugee camp in Syria and I was talking to a, a Syrian boy about 16 or 17 and, and he'd finished it. The camp's quite a good one. It's got uh, water and electricity and sanitation and so on and prefab buildings, unlike the terrible situation in Calais or in, on the Greek islands, which is just too awful to describe. But, but this, this young, young Syrian man, he'd finished his education in the camp. And I said, what now? And he said, well, I, I, um, I can't get a job in the camp. I can't get a job outside the camp. What do I do? And it's not safe to go back to Syria. And really what it set me thinking was the, the word is hope. If we can offer people hope, then that helps them uh, to cope with very difficult circumstances if there's some hope at the end of the line. And I think, I think uh, one of our duties as one of it is to give people hope. And I think both those that are trying to get to this country and to give them some hope and those that are being mentored, I think, I think the key word is hope. If we can give people hope and open doors to them so that they feel there is a life ahead of them. Uh, so so, so I, learned, I learned really the strength and the resilience people have shown. And it is a hint of a hope that they're willing to put up with awful things in order to reach a destination in their lives and, and, and get, get on with it. Uh, and, and so what I've learned is very humbling. I've also learned of the young people working with refugees and the way they're willing to work and support and help refugees. I should say a bit more about that. Um, in, in the jungle in Cali, or what I've been to Cali several times, or what's left of the jungle, people sleeping under tarpaulins under the trees, and they're young people who are working as volunteers with NGOs to, to, to help and support refugees. And I think that is pretty good because they're in a difficult situation and one can then make the connection between them and when they come here. And there was a, a, an older woman, I met a firefighter um, who gave up firefighting to, to support young people in, in the jungle in Calais and who's now doing the same thing in Birmingham. And she's providing ongoing support and contact and links. And, and, and this, is, this is pretty good because some of them don't have any links, you know, and if one can create links and contact and somewhere they can turn to for sort of day-to-day -day help and advice, which otherwise they can't easily construct for themselves in their early days in this country. Do you, do you think, Lord Dubs, that your own lived experience makes you more empathetic to the situation that refugees today find themselves in? Do you, and do you think that it's driven you? You talked about the refugees that you 
have worked with wanting to be politicians. Do you think that part of your own story is what made you want to be a politician and change the world as well? Well, okay, well, can I go back? First of all, I only met one refugee who said to me openly, uh, he wanted to become a British politician. I've met several who say they want to help in their local communities and, and work there. So don't, I'm not trying to push people into politics, good heavens. <laughs> You'll blame me if they all start wanting to become MPs. Uh, now, look, um, my own experience. Yes, I think one of the things that struck me about myself was, was when I was about uh, 12, 12 or 13, I became passionately interested in politics in a way that none of my school friends, non-refugee, non just, just my school friends locally, uh, none of my school friends were interested in politics. And I think it's because I was trying to understand why what had happened to me had happened. You know, I was puzzling out the reason for my having to flee uh, from the Nazis and so on. And this process of puzzling about it made me also think that if evil men can do such terrible things in politics, then maybe politics can also be used to help people in a more positive way. So I, I was passionate to enter politics and my ambition was to become a local councillor, um, which I did. But a friend of mine who was an MP said, oh, you have a, have a go. And I said, I can't, I'm a refugee. How can I become an MP? Oh, have a go, have a go. So I, I did have a go uh, and, and you know, had some successes in that. Uh, and then found myself in the Commons, and then eventually found myself in the Lords. So yes, I think so. But I was also for about eight years chief executive of the Refugee Council. So I, I think I felt, I think I felt uh, empathy with refugees, and I think I probably had a sort of uh, a, a felt an obligation to do something for refugees who who'd come to Britain in circumstances in some ways more difficult than the circumstances in which I'd come. But I've always felt that, and I, I felt. I felt my background has probably been a bit more positive, enabling me to understand what it is people have been through and, and how they may react, a bit anyway. I remember once I was asked to speak at a school in Kilburn, uh, and uh, it was one year, uh, and, and there were mainly immigrants or refugees, and it just so happened in this class. And, and I tried to make my usual little joke about saying, you know, I only spoke Czech and German when I came to English, uh, when I came to England. <laughs> <laughs> and normally people laugh a little bit. And if I say, you know, uh, if I make a bad speech, it's my third language. How good is your third language? Anyway, I was telling this story. And when I said to these, these 16, 17 year olds, uh, you know, that I only spoke uh, French and German, had to learn English. And instead of just laughing a little bit, they stood up and gave me a, a standing ovation because I think they felt that I understood um, what it meant for them, because they had to learn English. And that was quite an eye-opener, the way they responded so positively, that here was somebody talking to them who'd been through the experiences that they'd been through. And I think, I think that's always, that, that is always important. So, as I said earlier, one doesn't want to make them into museum pieces and, and, and treat them as different all the time, but one wants to engage with them, I think. And, uh, and if I can share my own experience with them, I think that they respond positively. Um, I, I thank you so much for, for sharing all of that with us. I, I just wanted to say thank you for giving us your time today. And earlier before you spoke about um, how the most important thing that we can do is give people hope um, and not treat them like museum pieces. And I think that is what I will take through me as we listen to the rest of the people who speak this afternoon. And as we all continue to do our work because if we don't all have hope and we don't believe that we can make a difference then um, you know, there's no point doing what we do and I think your words have helped us to do that so thank you very much. Well thank you for inviting me and uh, and again congratulations on, on, on the work you're doing and good luck in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.